Well, our proclamation text for this morning is the 85th Psalm. You showed favor to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, O God, our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints. But let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. This is the word of the Lord. Well, grace, peace, and love to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Whew, we got a baptism. <laughs> it just makes me happy. It just makes me happy. Just kind of like how Psalm 85 also makes me happy. Um, it holds with it the hope and the promise that God has been faithful and will continue to be faithful to his people. Isn't that something we need to hear right now? Uh, the psalm is filled with that hope and promise, and yet it was written in a time, amidst a time of waiting and uncertainty. Uh, the first two verses we'll read, or we had read, encourage us to remember what God has done for Israel and for us, looking favorably upon the land, restoring fortunes, centering most particularly on the forgiveness of sins as we turn our face to him. But in order to get a deeper understanding of this psalm and how it can be lived out in our lives, I want to focus on the center part of the psalm. And that's verse 6 is the center. All right. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Revive us, O Lord. Revive us so we may rejoice in you. You know, last week we heard Reese talk about uh, holding on to our psalm of praise. No matter what we are going through, we have a psalm of praise to sing to our God. And that's present in this psalm as well. And it's singing very loudly and clearly in this verse. Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? That's that praise coming from within. And so as we read this psalm, we find that verse 6 is actually the pivot verse, the pivot point between the past and verses 1 and 4 and the future, which are the following verses, 8 through 13. And we hear about what the Lord has done in those first few verses. It says, You, Lord, showed favor to your land, you restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. So did you hear it? There's that plea from Israel. The one of the psalmists, it's very similar to what we hear today. Restore us again. Are you going to continue to be angry at us? Help us, please, God. We're tired of this unrest. We're tired of being cooped up. We're tired of being quarantined. Help us. Restore us. Revive us, Lord. And I really love that phrase, revive us, Lord. It has such depth and power that we can use in our lives. To revive something is to bring it back to life, right? To bring it back active and flourishing again. And it'd be nice to see our lives active and flourishing again. To be revived, to come back to some form of normalcy for our schools and businesses and churches. But this revive us, O oh Lord, is deeper than we might think. This brings us back to our life of sin. To ask for forgiveness of those things that we have done and those things that we've left undone, that we could have or should have done. When we ask for that forgiveness, our sins are erased and we are, lived, we are able to live free then as God intended us to live. We're able to return to life. We are revived with that freedom that Jesus gives us when he went to the cross and died for us. So this psalm speaks to us not only personally, but corporately together, as it did there. 
But it is one thing to read about the fortunes of Jacob being restored in verse 1. I kind of had to dig a little bit into that because for me, when I read Scripture, I kind of want to know a little bit more. What does that mean, you restored the fortunes of Jacob? What do we know about those fortunes? And so what we're going to do this morning is take a look at Jacob, right? We're going to take a look how he got to be a pivotal person in our faith because until we understand the stories and the history of what shaped our Christian faith behind all that praise that we are giving him, we may just tend to gloss over it and lose the importance of it. Um, have some of you heard of maybe the term Jacob's generation? There's, it's, it's not one that we use a whole lot. It's not a phrase that's used quite, quite often, but it does have a following out there, Jacob's generation. It's a unique term that allows us to understand just how we can face God to turn and face him and receive forgiveness among all of our trials and tribulations. And this is hopefully going to make a little bit more sense as we go along. So here we go with a quick little rundown of Jacob's life. All right? We hear the Bible speak about our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? We've heard that. If you grew up in Sunday school, uh, you've heard Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The three generations of so much of our Old Testament and so much of our history uh, has grown and based out of. Um, all three of these forefathers went through challenges in their own lives, and God was faithful to them. It's really the core of, of what this foundation of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is. God was faithful. And even when they tried to mess it up, they were human, let's say. Right? But Jacob was a troublemaker from the beginning, even in the womb. All right? We hear it even in the womb. Uh, just to review, Abraham is Isaac's father. All right? Isaac is Jacob's father. And Isaac, Jacob's dad, married Rebekah. She, of course, got pregnant. And from the beginning, it would seem that she, those twins that were inside of her, were even feistier. Genesis 25, uh, if you guys want to follow along, you're more than welcome to later. But Genesis 25, starting verse 22, the babies jostled each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Be nice to be able to just ask God, what's going on in here? Right? So the Lord said to her, two nations are within your womb. The two peoples from within will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So we have a little insight into what's going to happen. When the time came for her to give birth, there were two twin boys that came from her womb. The first came out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. All right, so what did we learn out of just that particular reading itself? Right? Here's what we learned. We know that Esau means red hairy garment, <laughs> right? We heard that. And Jacob also has a name. Jacob in Hebrew means one who follows on another's heels or supplanter. Supplanter, not a term we use very often. But he was the second born and he supplanted from his brother the birthright, which we're going to hear about. A supplanter is someone who wrongfully takes the place of another. So here's how this plays out. In Genesis 27, once the boys are kind of grown and walk through a whole lot of stuff, just read 25 through like 35. It's amazing stuff, all right? Uh, Jacob and his mother hatch a plan to steal the birthright away from his brother Esau. They trick blind old Isaac, and so they had succeed then in stealing the birthright, which if you understand the history of ancient times, the birthright was the way to survive, all right? So Jacob steals uh, his birth, Esau's birthright, but eventually... Jacob, as he would, fears brother's retaliation. So he runs away, all right? Um, so think about Jacob of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? The godly legacy that we talk about that's linked to that lineage is the result of Jacob stealing or supplanting that birthright from his brother. And yet God still worked with him, all right? Otherwise, it would have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. It doesn't have the same ring to it, right? But remember back to the reading. God told Rebekah, while the boys were in the womb, that the younger was going to be the supplanter. So Jacob and his mom must have gotten tired of waiting for that because they took it into their own hands to make it happen. So Jacob isn't really looking very good right now, but things are looking up. So we're going to move to chapter 28. Uh, it's the great Sunday school story of Jacob's ladder. Some of you may remember that song, right? We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Three of you? Awesome. Good. All right. So although Jacob stole a birthright, God was still with him. So this is Genesis 28, all right? And this is Jacob's ladder, this dream that he has. When Jacob left Beersheba, he set out for Haran. 
When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and he lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Right? What a dream to have. Right? Isn't that amazing? He just dreams about this huge blessing he's having from God, a huge promise. I promise I will not leave you until this is done. So he's got to be feeling pretty good about it, maybe even a little invincible. But there's more, right? Because then he meets her. Jacob meets the one, the love of his life, his future wife, Rachel. And so he wants to marry her. But the trickster gets tricked. He works for Laban, who would eventually be his father-in-law, Rachel's father, uh, for seven years he works for him to earn the right to marry Rachel. Well, when that seven-year period ends and they do get up there to get married, the veil is lifted and boom, there's Leah, not who he worked for. But Leah was the oldest sister, so Leah was to be married first. So Laban just kind of slid her in place, (laughs) said, this has to happen. So instead of running away and Jacob being upset, he works another seven years for Rachel, right? 14 years total, just because he wanted to marry Rachel. Of course, he does eventually marry her. Now he has two sister wives, God bless him, and begins to have children, right? So stay with me because all this is still unfolding and we're going to eventually understand how all these fortunes of Jacob are restored. But we have to understand Jacob in order to understand the the restoration of this. So a few more chapters into Genesis, Jacob finds himself running from his father-in-law Laban back to his own family, primarily his brother Esau, right? Esau, the one he stole the family birthright. We can imagine Esau is still a little bit angry. So seriously, I mean, today's... Uh, shows, reality shows, don't have a whole lot to do more to, to give than the Bible does for us. Uh, but Jacob sends his family to Esau ahead of him to test the waters, and he holds back. He waits in the wings, so to speak, to see if Esau is going to try and get retaliation or revenge. And at this point, Jacob has another encounter with God, and this is in, G- in Genesis 32. And it uh, begins with verse 23. After he'd sent them across the stream, so after Jacob sends his family across, he sent over his possessions. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. And the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. And Jacob said, please tell me your name. And he replied, why do you ask my name? And then he blessed him there. Jacob has just now had his final conversion experience, if you will. Here he was, this trickster, this deceitful man from birth, from, from birth, really. And God took him and blessed him. He took, God took him, he broke him, literally, in his hip socket, but he never left him. And when Jacob had had enough, God finally revived his life, or at least Jacob saw that his life was revived. And now Israel was born. And from Israel comes Joseph and the whole, you know, the 12 tribes, and so we really see the descendants start to grow. But from all this brokenness of humanity, God did God's thing. And used Jacob, restores his fortunes, and did what he promised, multiplying his name from generation to generation. So Jacob's generation is about restoration. Jacob was restored, reviving life from death. And this isn't just a one kind of deal in Psalm 85. We hear it again in Psalm 24 as well. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. 
He founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive a blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation who will seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. This is Jacob's generation defined for us in the psalm. The term generation, then, is not necessarily in the past or the 20 years that you know, makes up a generation, but it seems to be any generation that sees themselves as sinful little tricksters trying to get their way by whatever means necessary, who wrestle with God and still, and still, even in the brokenness, see that God is working and reviving them if we simply turn and seek his face. See, we are Jacob's generation now. And if we're able to live into that, here's how we do it. We become the generation that seeks the face of God, that lives and dwells in his presence. We become the generation that seeks to walk in holiness of life, those clean hands that we heard about, the purity of heart, not self-righteousness, pointing fingers, but living humbly without bowing to the idols of our time. We become the generation that cries out for the king of glory to reign and for his glory to return to his body, the body of Christ. We become kingdom-minded people with God's glory in mind, not our own. See, Jacob's generation is us. We're obviously a broken people. And yet, now is the time to remember that God is faithful. So we bring back to Psalm 85, the first two verses. Lord, you showed favor to your land and restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. We see what you've done, Lord. Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? See, we know because we read the Bible and we look at the history that God has walked through with his people, that God restores his people. And so we look for our own revival. And because God is faithful to his people, we have to look at it as a promise that it also is. And we trust in that promise. When we turn and face God, when we wrestle with whatever it is that we're dealing in our lives, whatever you're dealing with in your life, know that God is there. God is there with you, with me, with us. And even though we may be broken from whatever life is thrown at us right now, Get your blessing. Don't let go of God. Keep your psalm of praise rolling. Know that God is speaking into your life and is reviving you and I as we speak. And when our lives are revived, when our lives are restored back to God, we can expect certain results. And so that will become then the second half of Psalm 85. This is the future promise when we seek God. Reading verses 10 through 13 again. It provides us that glimpse of what God envisions in his kingdom, what living as Jacob's generation will look like when fully embraced in God's kingdom. And so here's the expectation. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other with masks. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth. Righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. That's the absolute ideal way to live our life. And God's done it before. Who are we to say he can't do it again? Of course, it's not going to be easy. Nothing ever is. We're going to mess up. It's why we lift up these examples in Scripture that give us this hope. It's why we know that we can lean on the promise of a Savior, our Savior Jesus, right? Because if we had to do it on our own, we would be failures. And we would continue to mess it up. And if we could do it on our own, we wouldn't need Jesus to begin with. And yet, even though humanity tries to do it on our own, we try to supplant God on a daily basis, we are still loved by that same God who created us and is faithful to us. When we cry, revive us, O Lord, it's not a passive cry. We can't simply sit back and just wait for God to do God's thing. It's an active cry. It holds with us a submissiveness to God 
to allow God to control every single part of our lives. If we're turning our face toward him, remembering how he's always been faithful, and we believe that and we proclaim that, that's Jacob's generation. It's saying, God, we know that you've taken care of your people in the past. We believe that you're going to do it again. So show us now. Show us what we can do to help usher in your kingdom here. Because we're getting tired. We're getting angry. We're getting anxious. We don't want to live this way forever. Revive us, O oh Lord. There is an outcry from God's people for a revival. To restore our land back to the days where God mattered most to most folks. And I admit, I openly confess, I look for those days as well. I would love to witness a revival on a grand nationwide scale. And I believe that a God who created the universe can do something of that magnitude. But it feels large and overwhelming to me. I remember as I was talking about what a revival meant to folks, uh, a man that I truly love and respect, um, he once shared this with me. He said that if you expect a revival, you better be willing to move with it. Right? Makes sense. If you want a revival, remember you must be a part of it. It doesn't just happen over there. It happens in here. And that was kind of an eye-opener for me at that time. And it still is to this day. What more can I do in here? Keep asking. And I think in many ways we pray for a revival because we expect the world to change or get caught up to where we are. But if we don't continue to keep changing our hearts, if we don't start with ourselves first, then we make it harder for God to work through us. Revive us, O Lord, is what we long to hear, but it carries some challenges with us for us to overcome. Now, there's a wise old evangelist once asked, why don't we see a revival happening in the church in the United States today? The old preacher scratched his head. He thought for a minute. He said, the reason we're not living in a revival right now is because we're content to live without it. The reason we're not living in revival right now is we are content to live without it. Are we? Are we content to live without being revived? Are we content with living in sin and death? Are we simply content with sitting back and letting the world lead us? I'm not. When we cry, revive us, Lord, it means you've already helped your people in the past, but those people, God's people, turned and faced you and changed their life even when they were broken. And we are called to do the same. It's going to be hard. It's going to take patience, a lot of forgiveness, and love, and all those fruits of the Spirit that we talk about. But we have Jesus with us. And we have each other to lean on, distance-wise, when things get hard. God will give us what is good and will yield his harvest. But the revival begins with us, each one of us, making one little difference at a time. Loving, living, leading together as people, as one people in the body of Christ. We have to stop looking for others to do what we are called to do, to turn our face to God, to seek him out, and to live into the freedom that he gave us through his only son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Revive us, O Lord, but start with me. Amen. I invite you to stand as we pray. Gracious God, revive us. Revive us in all ways that you know we need to be moved. Move us back toward you. Move our face to face you, knowing that you will stare directly at us. We give you thanks that you've already overcome this world through your son, Jesus Christ. But we are living in this world right now, and we know you've restored the fortunes of Jacob, and you've restored our fortunes as well by sending us your son. We know there is a hope eternal we can lift up. And so we do that. We lift that to you. But we ask for you to move us. Revive us, O oh Lord. Amen. Folks, thanks for checking us out. Thanks for watching. Trinity is a discipleship-driven worship community. 
we'd love for you to come and be a part of this community as we uh, celebrate who Jesus Christ is in our lives. Uh, check us out on our website, trinityjapa.org. Uh, please go there, or we have plenty of social media outlets you can check us out as well on. Uh, if you'd like to physically come and see us, we'd love that as well. And uh, we have services on Sundays at 9 o'clock is our traditional service. We have a contemporary service at 11 o'clock. And we're really in, in looking forward to our second Saturday celebration service. It's the second Saturday of the month at 5 o'clock where we'll come together and, and worship. But plenty of outlets, plenty of ways to reach one another to connect with one another, and we'd invite you to do so with us. Love to have you. So in the meantime, go in peace. We'd love to see you soon. Thanks.